All right, First Timothy for Beginners, lesson number five, title of this lesson, The Role, Work, and the Qualification of Elders. First uh, Timothy chapter three, uh, verses one to seven. Well, now that Paul has uh, taught on the subject of the, you know, the role of men and women in the church uh, as, they relate, uh, as they relate to each other in the context of, uh, of, uh, of the church, uh, he goes on to provide more information about the qualifications for those men who will provide leadership. So you know, he, he, he establishes the idea that spiritual leadership given to the men in the context of the church, and now what kind of men are going to be leaders? And this is what he's going to talk about. He teaches that men, not women, are to aspire to spiritual leadership in the church and uh, now he defines the character of those few who will fulfill those positions in the assembly. We know that uh, God has always provided leadership for His people, so it's no different for the church. Elders are those who lead in the church and Paul will describe which men can aspire to this role in the body of Christ. So the preacher or the evangelist's role is to recognize and develop potential leaders in the church. That's one of the tasks of the evangelist. This is why Paul is teaching Timothy in this chapter. Not only why, but what he's teaching him in his chapter. He wants to help and guide Timothy in his search for and development of men who will grow as leaders. Because that'll be Timothy's task. He's going to have to find leaders. So he has to know, well, what am I looking for? So Paul begins by commending those uh, who would uh, seek uh, leadership roles in the church. He says, it is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. So to have this desire, he says, is, is a good thing. And the role itself is a good thing to want. So many men, in my experience anyways, they feel unworthy and unprepared, too unspiritual to serve as leaders in the church. Some of it is modesty, others sometimes it's reality. Paul addresses this issue immediately by stating that to desire to serve this way is not necessarily motivated by pride. It's a good thing if you have the feeling that you want to lead God's people, that you know, there's a role there for you and you think you'd like to tackle that role. That, that's a good thing, he says. That word aspire means to reach out for. It seems that this, you know, this if any man, you know what he says, if any man desires. Uh, this was a saying in the early church, something like saying, you know, praise the Lord was a saying. And Paul confirms that the saying is true. This idea that to aspire for leadership is a good thing, that's a true thing, that's, that's a good thing. So the first qualification of an elder is to desire to serve the Lord. If you have to be pressured, if you have to serve out of guilt, or you do it without conviction, you have to show, you know, uh, you have to show that you desire the thing. It's okay to say, well, should I go? I'll, I'll wait and see if other people confirm that they see this in me. That's okay. Modesty requires us to not think too highly of ourselves. But you have to want to. You have to want to because <laughs> it's a difficult thing to do. So there are three Greek words that are used to, to describe a, um, a person uh, and the role of a church leader. And all three words describe the same person, the same role. It's just different facets of the man and his work. So one of the words is uh, presbyteros. In English, we transliterated that word to simply mean, or to simply pronounce it as presbyter, or elder is another way of translating that Greek word. And this word describes the person himself, a person of maturity. It refers to a man of age, of a certain age. Uh, ones who are older than others by comparison. You know, today, if you're 65, 
well, you're not that old in comparison to others in your, in your group in, in today's. But if you were 65 years old in the first century, yeah, yeah because the life expectancy was somewhere around 50 years old. So, you know, you, you apples with apples type thing, okay? Um, uh, it also refers, as I say, to one who is older than others by comparison. For example, uh, they use the same word for the elder son in the parable of the prodigal son, the elder son. They use that same word, Luke 15, 25. It also indicates the office or the position of elder, 1 Peter 5, 5. So the context determines the meaning, whether it's talking simply about a man who is mature or a man who holds the office of elder or presbyter uh, in a church. The Jews also used the term presbyteros to describe the older men as well as the office of elder in Judaism within the synagogue or within the Sanhedrin. Same role was within the Jewish system, Matthew 16, 21. The Gentiles used the word to describe a position held within the government of a town. You had the elders, you know, the city elders had no, no link to religion. It simply meant the older, wiser men who were in charge of the, of the city. So both Jews and Gentiles, therefore, were well aware of the significance of this word in reference to a leadership position as well as the maturity of the one who held it. So it was a common word, everybody understood what it meant. Another word, used to describe this role and this person, episkopos. Episkopos in English, an overseer, another way translated into English, a bishop, a superintendent, a guardian, all of these words translate, uh, the wor translated into English from the word, the Greek word, episkopos. This term describes the work or the office which the elder exercises. However, many times it refers to the person who does the work. It suggests authority, the authority to lead, the authority to oversee, the authority to supervise or guard. First Timothy 3.1, Acts 20.28 20, uses this word. First Peter 2.25, Peter uses this term in reference to Jesus. He says he's the guardian of your soul, episcopos of your souls. In Philippians 1.1, Paul demonstrates that this role of overseer or bishop was a specific office in the church even at that time, and not just a leadership quality of a certain man or certain men in the congregation. You know, he writes to the church and he begins, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons. So he specifies, there were, you know, everybody in the church, all the saints, I'm writing to all of you, but specifically to the overseers, or the elders, or the bishops, or the superintendent, you know, there are many, many words, always describing the same person. Another word, poimen. Poimen meant pastor, or shepherd. This word describes the way that the man actually did his work. The word describes the attitude that the leader has in his work with the congregation under his care. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, and Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, Matthew 9, it is used of Christ. He's the good shepherd. Ephesians 4, 11 uses the term pastor, one who shepherds. Most familiar, a most familiar imagery for both Jews and Gentiles of the day, a shepherd caring, guarding his flock. So these were not kind of like obscure words just made up by the apostle. These were very common words that were circulating in that culture that were appropriated for specific roles in the church. Note that all three words apply and refer to the same person and the same office within the church. All English translations refer to the same person and the same role. The presbyter, for example. Uh, 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 the word priest comes from this word. The term elder or overseer or bishop or superintendent or guardian or shepherd or pastor. All of these words refer to the exact same person in the Bible. I'll give you an example. 
Um, uh, a man can be a father, but can also be a son. He can be a brother, he can be a husband and a friend. And yet all those words refer to the same man. Well, in the same way, all these words refer to the same persons, okay? In the New Testament, this person was always a man and always served in a group of two or more men for each congregation. If, if you went throughout the New Testament, or especially the book of Acts, but if you went through uh, Acts 14, 23, 15, 2, 15, 23, Acts 20, 17, 28, Philippians 1, 1, on and on and on. Every time they talk, every time the writers talk about elder, an elder in the church, make reference to elders, it's always plural. You know, when Paul writes in Philippians 1, 1, he's greeting the church. He didn't say, and the overseer. He says, and the overseers, always plural. Well, there's a reason why it's always plural. Different churches, different situations, but when referring to the elders, it was always plural, not singular. Why? Because there was never just one. There were always two or, two or more. Um, it doesn't actually teach that. It'd be nice if you open the Bible somewhere in Timothy and he says, I command that there should always be more than one elders. But that's, the, the Bible doesn't teach us only in one way. Sometimes it teaches us by telling us or commanding or you know, thou shalt not kill, repent and be baptized, you know, sometimes. Sometimes it teaches us by example or inference. So what are we to conclude? If every time we read about, an, about the position of elder in the church, every single time throughout the New Testament, when we read about that, it's always in the plural. Well, I would, I would conclude that all the churches in the New Testament who had elders had more than one. Okay, so there's a teaching by example. So, to summarize a little bit about what he talked about in the last lesson and in what we're talking about tonight, in other words, in the New Testament, no church ever had a woman as an elder or pastor, and no church ever had only one pastor or elder or bishop. They always had two or more men who would serve in the local congregation. Also, in the New Testament, there's never a bishop or pastor or elder put in charge of more than one congregation. The church that is talked about in the New Testament is not a pyramidic design. You know, one guy on the top, two or three beneath him, six or seven beneath that guy, 50 over here, and then a thousand. In the New Testament, the church is always described as a local entity, self-contained entity. That's the New Testament style or, or design uh, for the church of uh, our Lord. So each congregation had its own elders who led locally, but had no authority beyond their own congregations. How far we have gone away from that model <laughs> and how much trouble we've gotten in because, I'm not saying we, but you, know, you look around in the world, in the denominational world, how much trouble <laughs> have churches gotten into because they didn't follow this model. A good example of these three words all being used in the same sentence is uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. He says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So in verse 17 of that same uh, passage, Paul, it says that Paul sent for the presbyteros in verse 17 to come to see him. He sent for the elders, plural, to come to see him. In verse 28, he tells, let me see, yeah, in verse 28, he tells the episcopos, in other words, the overseers, bishops, or guardians, to poimen, to shepherd the flock, which is the church. So the elders who are overseers should shepherd the flock. Same person, three different words. Mature men, elders, who had the responsibility and authority, bishops, overseer, guardians, to care for the church, shepherd, pastor. All right, so let's talk about the work of these leaders. 
Um, and before we go on to the following verses that describe the qualifications necessary for church leaders, we need to examine their work. In this way, the qualifications will make a lot more sense. So these are basic things, basic principles here, 1 Timothy, but good to review. Seven tasks of the elder. Number one, to teach, to teach. 1 Timothy 3.2, an overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Paul says apt, meaning skilled at teaching, skilled at giving and providing instruction for others. Since the church grows by its knowledge of God's word in theory and practice, this ability is extremely important. Second task, to protect Acts, we read already in verse 20, 28, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So he says, be on guard. An attitude of watchfulness over the church watches mainly over false doctrine and practices in the church. In Titus 1.9, it says there that elders' method of defense is to know the word like he needs to know the word himself and maintain this doctrine in the face of opposition, able to refute false teaching if necessary. In Hebrews 13, 17, the writer refers to the elders or the leaders as watchmen, because elders are responsible for souls, their task and appointment is from God, so they must be careful what they teach. Third task, lead. 1 Timothy 5.17, the elders who rule well. There's no, way to, <laughs> there's no way to interpret this to mean that they're not in charge. I've heard people try to say, well, well elders, you know, they cooperate with the congregation. Not, they're not really in charge. You know? And I say, really? Well, let's take a look at 1 Timothy 5.17 and see if you can wrangle something else out of the elders who rule well. <laughs> are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and uh, preaching and teaching. They stand before the congregation, not as kings, you know, not that kind of leadership, not that kind of rulership, but as shepherds. There's a difference there. In 1 Peter 5, Peter says, therefore I exhort the elders, there's another plural there, the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but providing, uh, to be, proving rather to be examples uh, to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility. All of you means you younger men and you elders. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So elders lead in Christ-likeness. This means that their leadership is not only for budget matters, but they lead also in holiness and sacrifice and service and mercy and spiritual maturity. I mean, how else does the flock learn and imitate these things unless there are some who will lead them in these things? Number four, task of church leaders, they minister to the sick. James 5, 14, says, anyone sick among you or among you sick? Then he must call for the elders. Oh, there's that plural again. He must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in the faith will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven uh, him. So we're wanting our most mature spiritual members to pray and minister and these should be found among our elders. You know, now James 5, 14, 15 could mean two things. A prayer of faith can raise up those who are sick. We've seen that with Marty, right? The church intently, and especially our elders, were praying for him and he's well. 
So it could mean a prayer of faith can raise up the ill. Also a prayer of faith can strengthen someone who has been weakened by the ravages of sin. Excuse me. So either meaning is possible here based on the Greek words. We simply use the one that fits because both are true and can apply. For example, in Acts 8, 11, 24, Simon the sorcerer, he asked Peter to pray for him because he had sinned. Peter was a leader. In Acts 28, 8, there's prayer and the laying on of hands done for uh, those who were ill. A word about anointing with oil. It was a sacred custom among the Jews. Kings, for example, were anointed at coronation. The term, the Lord's anointed one, became synonymous with the term king, 1 Samuel 12. The Jews believed that the anointing with oil carried with it a transfer of some of the holiness and virtue of the Lord in whose name the anointing was done. So it had a very spiritual connotation. They also thought that it imparted a special endowment of the spirit, 1 Samuel chapter 16, this was in the Old Testament. In the same way as baptism, the anointing with oil was effective because of the faith involved and not because the oil or the water had any power, there's no magic oil or anything like that. Uh, another task, and uh, by the way, there's still some that do it today, just as a, a symbolic gesture, but there are some people that, uh, I don't mean just the big, uh, the trend today of uh, using all kinds of different oils, but I mean there are churches where elders do use oil still as a way of, uh, 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 of encouraging the uh, person who is, uh, who is ill. Next one, uh, five, shepherd the flock. Luke 15, he said, Jesus uh, says, uh, so he told them this parable saying, what, a man, uh, what man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So the church leader models his role after Christ. He's the source of protection, spiritual nourishment, guidance in the Christian way to the congregation. The work of a shepherd are, are, what, are, are what the qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 2 to 7 fit him for. He's a shepherd and later on you know, we'll go over the, the qualifications that this shepherd should have in order to qualify to be an elder. Number six, discipline. Let's go to Titus for this. Uh, he says, holding fast the faithful word, this person, this elder, holds fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the uh, circumcision who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. So discipline means two things or activities. One, to give teaching and correction to one who is in error. What they're teaching is wrong, it's not biblical. And so they're being disciplined in the sense of they're being taught the correct way. Or it can mean a rebuke or an admonishment to someone who's disobedient or rebellious or divisive in the church. In every congregation and every family, there's always somebody who needs to have the authority. Authority to protect against internal attack and danger. And the elders in the church are the ones who serve this role. Who else? And then number seven, mature the saints. Mature the saints. Ephesians 4, Paul says, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors. Whoops, sorry, I had to point it out again, plural and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith 
and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in a deceitful uh, scheming. Uh, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And so the elder's role is to help the church grow up and increase in its ability to imitate and serve Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. When Christ comes, he will complete the elder's task of transforming the church into what it was meant to be, the perfect body and complement to Christ himself. For now, they provide spiritual leadership through teaching and example and guide the church so its activities are in line with overall biblical teaching and principles. I like to say the elders are helping the church to prepare for the coming of Christ. They're getting the church ready for that by making sure that they remain, the church remains faithful to Christ's teaching, faithful to their uh, confession of, uh, of faith, faithful in their in their actions. Okay, uh, yeah, we need to move along. Qualifications he talks about now in chapter three, um, the next verse, verse two. So we're going to look at qualifications. He says, an overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectful, hospitable, able to teach. So let's look at these um, individually, shall we? Elder needs to be above reproach. So he begins with positive attributes. Now here above reproach doesn't mean sinless. It means a man who has made right, uh, who has made right to the best of his ability the things that are wrong in his life um, so that these matters cannot be charged to him again. Yeah, I used to smoke, uh, yeah, I used to smoke cigarettes you know, when I was in my 20s or you know, uh, but I quit you know, way back then. You know, I've made that right. Somebody couldn't say, hey, you know what? Your preacher smoked. You know, well, what well, gives him the right to get up and tell people what to do? He, he, used to, he was addicted to nicotine. Well, you know, yeah, uh, up to 1977, yes, but not since 1977, you know what I'm saying? So in the same way, above reproach doesn't mean you've You've never made a mistake. You've never done something wrong. It means you've corrected what you can and you've moved on, you've grown up above reproach. Nobody has something that can dis discredit you. The elder lives now in such a way that he will not cause shame on himself or the church. The husband of one wife, yes. A lot of debates about this particular verse and what it means. For example, lots of different things. It can mean a person who has only had one wife in all of his life and that wife is still alive. It can mean that. It can mean a person who is not a polygamist, although he may have been one in the past. You know, he had many wives, now he only has one wife. It can mean a person who is properly married, even though he may have been a widower or a divorcee in the past, again. He's the husband of just the one wife. Now the literal translation of the saying, husband of one wife, this is a saying, okay? It's a, it's a colloquialism, you know? it's a saying of the time. We don't use this anymore, but in those days they used that. So the literal translation of the saying, husband of one wife is, we want a man who is a one woman man. That's the literal translation of it, a one woman man. Now, what's interesting is that Paul could have clarified this by saying, just very clearly, elders, uh, an elder needs to be a man who has never been divorced or widowed. Man, that would have been clear as glass, right? <laughs> he could have said that. But he chose this saying instead. I think he was referring to attitude here and not legal status, you know, like a widower, that's a legal status. You were married, your wife is deceased, you are now a widower. Uh, you were married, you were divorced, 
uh, that's a legal status. You were legally married, now you're legally divorced. And you're legally remarried. Okay? Those are legal uh, status. Uh, uh, but in the beginning here, Paul is, is, is talking about attitudes, not legal positions. And so a one woman man eliminates polygamists and it speaks to the faithfulness of a man as a husband, whether he's been widowed or divorced previously. Again, it could mean that. It could also mean a man who has only one wife has never had any other wives and that wife is still alive. It, that's why there's a debate. That's why different people have come to different conclusions about this. Uh, if you're looking at it from the perspective of a one woman man, it's referring to a man who is not a flirt, not a man who's involved with other women, who pays attention to a lot of other women, who always has to catch the woman's eye. You've seen guys like that. They can't even go into Applebee's and have a meal with their wife without kind of you know, shining on the, on the waitress and you know, hitting her up with a lot of conversation, so on and so forth. You know? So an elder must be devoted to the woman he's married to. I believe this is the point. But of course, as I say, there are different ways to interpret this as well. Uh, temperate is the next one. Uh, a man who thinks straight, who's sober-minded, not going off on every idea or carried away by emotion. Someone who's well-balanced um, and not excessive. You know. Today we'd say, no drama. You know, we want a man who's not continually creating drama around him. Uh, another one, he says, a man who's prudent, uh, balanced in his judgment, a man who's self-controlled, who's careful, someone who is not swayed by sudden impulse. Your sudden impulse affects 300 or 400 other people. You need to be careful. Uh, he also says, must be respectable. Dignified, another word, another word for the word here is dignified, but not haughty, not regal, not that way. In other words, inward moral excellence that shows itself in an outward orderly existence. He's a respectable person. His behavior is consistent, diligent. His conduct inspires respect from other people. Okay? Uh, you, know, you don't let your child call you by your first name. I forget which one of our kids, but somebody tried that once. I'm sure it wasn't Paul, but uh, they said, uh, I forget what context, but they say, so Mike, uh, what do you think? You know, and I went, excuse me? <laughs> I said, no, no. <laughs> I'm dad to you, you know, dad, father, sir, uh, you know, but I'm not Mike to you. So the same idea, sometimes, you know, some men, uh, don't have a way of at least you know, getting a little bit of respect for themselves. And so we want people who are able to act in a respectable fashion and draw respect from others. Hospitable, uh, we know what it means, the a lover of strangers. In New Testament times, hospitality was important and sometimes dangerous since uh, there was uh, persecution at the time. And it was risky offering hospitality to preachers and teachers who traveled from place to place to, to help the church. So not just one who offers food and, 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 and a place to stay, but someone who accepts those of different cultures, different ideas, different backgrounds. Okay. And then he says, apt to teach, we've talked about that, it means to be skillful in teaching, a person who gets results, able to grow in their ability to teach. Uh, and not necessarily, this term here, not necessarily someone who's an orator, a professional public speaker, but someone who can communicate effectively with other, other uh, people. Uh, verse three, let's read verse three. He says, continuing with the uh, qualification, he says, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. So not a drunkard, right? Not a drunkard. So here he begins some negative things. So in those days, you know, wine was a common beverage like water today in New Testament times. 
So the point is not to abstain from wine, it was used, it was a common usage among all families. Um, the passage means that an elder is not addicted to wine or any other thing for that matter, not addicted to porn or to videos or shopping or food or drugs. You know. The, the thing that wine has in common with all those things is that there is an addictive property within it that you need to be very, very careful for. And again, uh, these are common sense things that you want uh, in your leadership. Uh, he says, uh, not uh, a drunkard, sorry, uh, not pugnacious, you know, not a brawler, not a fighter, not someone who's confrontational, especially someone who likes confrontation. They, 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 they feed off of confrontation. You don't want that kind of uh, person. Someone who uh, is aggressive or verbally abusive, yeah, that's not, a good, uh, that's not a good thing for an elder to be because it'll just provoke trouble, never ending problems. Uh, on the contrary, he goes to something po uh, positive. He said, you, we want him to be gentle. One who is not self-willed, that's what gentle means. You know, my way or the highway, the guy who's my way or the highway, yeah, he's not meek, that's not meekness, that's not gentleness. Someone who is flexible, considerate of the views of other people, someone who's yielding, not authoritarian. It's not an easy thing, you know, to balance these qualities. You need someone who's not afraid to take leadership, someone who's not afraid to make decisions, to call a spade a spade, so to speak, but also that same person needs to be flexible and willing to listen to other people's ideas and opinions. Uh, uncontentious, not quarrelsome or causing strife or division. Some people through gossip or attitude, they cause trouble wherever they are. On the contrary, elders create peace and they create harmony not trouble. Free, he says, from the love of money. A person who doesn't judge everything from a money perspective, like the bottom line is always, how much is it going to cost? The person who uses money, but it's not the driving force of their lives. Not addicted to making and spending and, and, and saving money. You know, the, the driving force of our lives is Jesus Christ, not money. Money is a tool that we use. Money is a, something that God gives us to use in his, in his service, to care for ourselves and of course to care for other people. He says he must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of, of God? Again, common sense, right? Another qualification, a well-managed home keeping his children under control and respectful of his leadership in the house. And he does this with dignity, meaning he's serious about his family and its conduct. The true test for a good church leader is not if he is successful in business or rich or powerful. There's no mention of this in the Bible. The true test is how he has led and managed his own home. One who does a good job at home can be expected to do a good job with God's family, the church, because they're both families. And a lot of what goes into being a good dad goes into being a good elder. Then verse six, he says, and not a new convert so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation uh, incurred uh, by the devil. So again, not a new uh, convert. A man with experience as a Christian, since leaders are especially attacked by Satan in many ways. I've seen a lot of churches destroyed simply by attacking the leadership. There could be a thousand people in the church and five elders, and if you can get those five elders you know, divided and fighting against each other, it'll ruin the, it'll ruin the thousand. I mean, I've seen it many times. So leadership in any position, especially the church, can go to one's head and a leader who is proud becomes vulnerable to temptation. You know, uh, Solomon says, pride goes before destruction, Proverbs 16, 18. Unfortunately, in the church, when a leader falls, he brings a lot of souls with him. The danger is that the inexperienced elder would fall into pride and receive the same judgment as Satan, who also fell because of pride. Look at verse seven here, it says, and he must have a good reputation with those outside the church 
so that he will not fall into uh, reproach and the snare of the devil. So a good reputation outside of the church. The point is that the elder represents the church, so any accusation against him also falls on the church as well. So if a leader is disgraced because of his reputation, he can be used as a pawn in Satan's effort to discredit the church. Now there are other qualities mentioned in Titus, the book of Titus, but uh, these are the ones that Paul lists here. This is not an exhaustive list. I mean, we could have said someone who's honest and kind and loving, you know, we could have added those. But this is a kind of a snapshot of the type of man who fits the role of elder or pastor, whatever you want to call it. Note that these qualifications, except for that of being a man and being married, they're all qualities. In other words, we want him to be temperate, but the question is, well, how temperate do you need to be in order to qualify as an elder? How gentle do you need to be in order to qualify as an elder? Because there are qualifications and you know, there's the very temperate, not so much temperate. Where, where, what's the passing grade? Because these are qualities and attitudes that all Christians should have. All Christians should be temperate and prudent and gentle and so on and so forth, right? So how, how much of this do you need to qualify as an elder? Well, the answer is that a potential leader has all of these qualities to a degree that they are visible to other people. For example, a well-managed home. Well, a potential leader has a home life that others know about. That they say, you know, brother so-and-so, they, they have such a nice family, you know, and the kids are involved, you know. Or hospitable. A potential leader is well known for his hospitality. Why? Because many in the congregation have experienced it. So, the point is that a potential leader's qualifications are obvious and visible and growing. You don't have to wonder if he is gentle or if he's not confrontational because you've seen these qualities in him already. They may continue to grow, but they're absolutely, they're absolutely there. Okay, one more point here and I'm done. So how are elders appointed or, or, or chosen, if you wish? Well, the only example in teaching that we have in the New Testament concerning this is in the following verse. In Acts chapter 14, verse 21 to 23, it says, after they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So Paul appoints them through prayer and the laying on of hands. Fasting and prayer to seek the Lord's will to make a right selection. The laying on of hands to publicly authorize their new leadership roles and confer authority. We've done that here. We've, uh, you know, when uh, Mike Coghill was hired as a minister, he went up front and he and his wife, the elders gathered together. They, they laid hands on them. They commended them uh, to the service of the, uh, uh, of the church. Uh, Titus also has something. It says, uh, Paul says to Titus, for this reason I left you in Crete that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. So the evangelist appoints the elders. The term appoint means to raise up, signifying to find them, to train them, to authorize them. So elders are not self, my point is, elders are not self-appointed. You don't get up one day and say, I, I, believe, I, I believe I'm elder material. You know? I believe I'm just going to appoint myself. No, or I believe I'll get a bunch of people in the congregation you know, to, to, to kind of nominate me. You know? No, it doesn't work that way. You know? In both situations, what was, what, 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 what one thing was common to both of these verses? They were chosen. They were both. In one, they were chosen by Paul. In the other, they were chosen and trained by the evangelist. Okay. So they're selected and trained and appointed by evangelists and elders according to the teaching and qualifications found in the New Testament. The beauty of the system 
is that in other passages, the Bible says that the elders appoint or commend evangelists into ministry so that they can create an ongoing cycle of growth. Evangelists appoint elders, elders appoint evangelists, they plant churches, train and raise up more elders who will then in turn appoint evangelists and it just keeps on going and going and going until we get here today where we have a full complement of, of elders and evangelists, okay? All right, we're going to stop right there. I think that's a lot of stuff for one, one sitting. We'll continue with 1 Timothy next time. Thank you for your patience, I appreciate it.